So in, 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 in the, uh, wanting to endow DNA Day, uh, uh, a key consideration was this is a, essentially an awful time of year. And uh, uh, we've had uh, in the past at the lab little symposium in late February just sort of to break up the the nastiness of the winter. So uh, if DNA Day had been in July, we wouldn't have this meeting. But uh, it comes just at the right time to um, when I think people need a break. And uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we do have, uh, I think, if you know, put it way in the future, sort of, uh, you know, we have our Christian religious origin on Christmas, and uh, our secular origin has to be uh, DNA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll never know when the Big Bang occurred, <laughs> and uh, so we can't celebrate that. But, uh, uh, and sort of, it's sort of my feeling that, you know, uh, even in the United States, we'll become much more secular. <laughs> and that, uh, uh, not that, you know, religion will totally disappear or uh, its functions, but that, uh, you know, I mean, it'd be strange. I just can't conceive of, you know, heaven or hell existing <laughs> or an afterlife or, you know, the, uh, uh, the resurrection and all that, it's just, you know, it can't exist. So, you know, what percentage of people in the world will, you know, inherently want a secular explanation for the start? I don't know. Um, but uh, in the anyways, we'll have the holiday and uh, this is being, I think, put on the web. And so hopefully other people will tune into it. I'm uh, delighted uh, that uh, in DNA repair was chosen. I had nothing to do with it, but uh, uh, I think about it a lot because, if, you know, <laughs> life as it exists it depends on a very good DNA repair system. And so DNA repair had to come in pretty early. It wasn't a late thing. And, uh, you know, if you really wanted to save the world, you would just re make DNA repair safer. I mean, better. Just imagine you could uh, repair twice as many mistakes as we now do. I mean, it would have an enormous effect on the world. And likewise, if the mutation rate went up a factor of two, <laughs> then uh, where would the money come for the mental hospitals, et cetera? I mean, we'd begin to be seriously handicapped by, uh, I think to the point of where at times, uh, when, uh, yeah, I can say it, but shouldn't, you know, they, should all life be maintained? If it's too miserable and then going nowhere, it's a, it's a question which we're not allowed to uh, to ask. But uh, um, in certain families, or you know, at the end of life and so on, they they they're sort of pro-life. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I had to, for two minutes last night listen to Cruz, you know, <laughs> on pro-life. <laughs> oh, it was scary. Yeah. I mean, Trump comes across as such a more likable person. You know, he, he'll, he'll let anything, any view be maintained, <laughs> whether the Ku Klux Klan or, you know, maybe even DNA. So, <laughs> but, uh, so we're going to be always inherently controversial, I think. And, uh, it's my hope that Cold Spring Harbor can uh, um, remain a place where, uh, you know, free speech is always permitted. Uh, to my horror, I got a note from Tim Hunt today saying he'd been invited to give a talk at Woods Hole, and then words came by that he was forbidden to speak by some higher authority because he was politically incorrect. And, 
Uh, I hope someone organizes a protest just saying we will not go to Woods Hole and give a talk there unless you have free speech. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm sure Trump is for free speech, so if I sound pro-Trump, <laughs> it's only because I don't think Sanders is going to get the Democratic nomination. So, but now to just to go on to uh, uh, DNA, uh, on the, uh, the cover there, there's this picture of me which was to be on the cover of Time magazine in early April of 1968. The, uh, my publisher had got time interested in the book, and they had commissioned this painting, which was done by a Mexican artist. And then suddenly, when the week came that I was to be on the cover, I wasn't. I was replaced by uh, the uh, French student radical Danny the Red. <laughs> and uh, so I was disappointed because, you know, being on the cover of Time was a real symbol that you'd arrived. And uh, so uh, about a year ago, a Mexican friend of ours, uh, Zurel Martinez, was in Mexico City and, and met the artist who said he had this painting and he would sell it. So uh, Zurel got $1,000 for the finder fee and I paid the artist $10,000. and. Uh, so I've sent it back to Time Magazine, or a copy of it, <laughs> saying that it's the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Double Helix. They might consider uh, putting, it, putting it on. But uh, uh, I like it particularly because what it, uh, it makes me look so young. <laughs> you know, I can realize why I, I could marry a 19-year-old because, you know, I didn't look then uh, 40. <laughs> Uh, though uh, uh, when the painting was done, I was 38. Um, and uh, it's very accurate. Uh, and uh, so uh, from the moment that you know we had this structure, I realized the story of how it happened was and too much fun to be kept from the, the public. So I was going to write it up from the very beginning. And then uh, uh, I knew I had, could write it up. Or, uh, I suddenly had a title, Honest Jim. And that was nothing I made up, but I'd been in the summer of 56 in the Alps with Guido Pontecorvo and uh, in uh, South Fay. And we were at a sort of a base camp, uh, about to walk up a little ways, and suddenly an English party came down, and they were from King's College London, where Wilkins was. And one of them was Willie Seeds, who worked with him. And he looked at me, and said, I was on a shim, and went on. That was his only words to me. So I realized that in King's, I had been called, or was still called, on a shim. And, you know, it raised the question, uh, should we have thought about their data? And uh, so, and then the, the second thing besides having the title for the book was uh, when I started to write chapter one and was trying to get an opening sentence, I thought, I've never seen a Francis in a modest mood. And that really was the, uh, then that let me, you know, uh, have something to write about it in the first paragraph. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I wrote the first paragraph. I didn't uh, go on until we got the Nobel Prize, which we did. Six, I, it was in September of 1962 that I wrote the first chapter. So that was nine years afterwards. And uh, I did it from memory. I had no notebook at the time we found the double helix, so everything was pure memory. Uh, some of them uh, I know to be correct, but uh, in honesty, you know, they were just, I know certain facts, and then I had to make up the story 
you know, in between, small details. And uh, so I made up the uh, small detail that we walked in the Eagle and Francis said we just discovered the structure of life. Because that's what should have happened. <laughs> But, you know, and everyone reads it, it reads correctly. So uh, the main thing was to make the book have a consistent tone. And uh, uh, originally, when I finished the manuscript, within a, a week of finishing it, uh, uh, I told Aaron Meyer at Harvard that I'd done it, and he was a syndic of Harvard Press, and he said Harvard Press should publish it. And then the uh, publisher, editor, Tom Wilson, came over and read it, and next day he said, we want to publish it. And uh, so I thought for a year they were going to be the publisher, but then uh, uh, when we sent a version to Francis Crick, he wrote a letter to the, uh, President at Harvard objecting, and uh, so uh, Harvard decided that they didn't want to be in a fight among uh, scientists, and uh, didn't. So I went to a commercial publisher, and it was only when I went to the commercial publisher that the title became the Double Helix. It, it was probably a good thing for mine because when it was reviewed. Uh, the book as a whole was reviewed instead of you could have easily focused on the the title, which, you know, was a question of what is the ethical way to behave in science. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I thought there could be the three great gems, uh, uh, Lord Jim, uh, Lucky Jim, and Honest Jim. And uh, so sometime I may just make some copies of the double helix uh, upward, change the title so that you can, which says Honest Jim, because that's certainly the way uh, the book would have appeared if Francis uh, had uh, objected. Uh, and uh, so that's the title that appeared. Uh, it was to about uh, almost uh, 40 years later that uh, I followed it up with my book, Avoid Boring People, which uh, was sort of autobiography until the age of 50. And uh, it was going to be, its original title was Manners for Science, because it had rules. How should you behave if you're going to succeed in science? And one of the rules was uh, avoid boring people. And that was used twice because uh, as a teacher, you don't want to bore your students. As a student, you don't want a boring teacher. And uh, so, uh, and that was a photograph of me uh, uh, when I was uh, still at Harvard. Uh, uh, when I left Harvard, the office was taken over by Lou Cantley. Uh, and a really nice office. So, uh, 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 to me, I, I just believe that everyone should get as big an office as is possible because you could retreat from people and, you know, have your personal possessions and everything like that. Uh, just the opposite will occur in the new Francis Crick Institute where the idea is to have, if you have no offices, people will talk to each other. <laughs> Whereas uh, in Cambridge, we had the perfect thing. We had a big office that housed Francis and I, and it eventually had six people. And so we talked within the office. Uh, and I'll come back to that. So uh, I'll just sort of go through, you know, why I, uh, and these were sort of my rules for being a successful boy. And, uh, so my chief aim was not to get beaten up. And so uh, avoid fighting bigger boys or dogs. And uh, so I was never beaten up. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I'm just reading a biography of Robert Oppenheimer. He was beaten up. <laughs> you know, he, he just <laughs> was a threat to other boys. But you know, the way I tried to compensate for being small was always put spin on balls. I think that's the most important 
rule in now when I play tennis. You know, hardly hit a tennis ball that doesn't have spin on. And you, you can stay in the game. And another thing which uh, sort of marked me out <laughs> as a real sissy, never accept errors to put your life at risk. <laughs> so I never worried about, you know, being known as a sissy. It was better to be, you know, alive as a sissy than dead as a... <laughs> And I did know several people who, you know, died uh, from <laughs> doing stupid. And then to, to get serious, only, accept only advice that comes from experience as opposed to revelation. <laughs> that is evidence. <laughs> there has to be evidence for believing in something. And uh, so this could be another way of saying, uh, you know, religion is not for me. And then hypocrisy and social, social acceptance. Don't try and you know, get friends by trying to be what you aren't. Uh, and very important, <laughs> never insult a teacher, <laughs> which is, you know, sort of common among boys when they're in grammar school. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not good. And another thing which, uh, you know, when intellectually panicking, get help quickly. Just don't spend a couple of days not knowing how to solve a math problem. Just, you know, if you can't solve it, find someone who will help you. So uh, it's more important to be first than to be the first in getting the answer than to be do it all yourself. But there's a lot of uh, sort of training. You know, you have to have enough. Persistence, you know, that you don't give up too soon. So it's a mixture of <laughs> uh, knowing. But uh, later in life, I realized, you know, Francis Crick knew some math, but he had to get help. Uh, and then now we read Einstein needed help. So, so I, I think it's probably true. Everyone needs help if you're at the sort of borderline of what you're doing. There's always someone else who can do it better than you. But if you put the whole thing together. Anyways, uh, that's it. And then I went on to the University of Chicago, which uh, I got in really because the president was uh, depressed by the state of the American educational scheme and thought one way to improve the high schools would be to cut them down to two years in length. <laughs> so you'd only waste two years in high school. And uh, so he admitted uh, some of us at the age of 15. And uh, that had, uh, so I never uh, learned to do, uh, you know, I never learned Spanish, which accounts for one of my prejudices and where I'm Donald Trump-like. I don't want to speak Spanish because I had never learned it in high school, whereas Spanish was so easy, it was something that everyone could learn in high school. But I, the University of Chicago didn't teach me Spanish. And you, that was the, the high point of my undergraduate education was going to the University of Michigan Biological Station for a summer. And uh, so that was really uh, fun. And you can sort of see those were Bungalows, those were bigger, much bigger houses than the one I was raised. The one I was raised had only two bedrooms. And my grandmother was in one of them, so my sister and I were in an attic. Not very nice, but uh, we survived. And uh, the most important thing is that I started growing when I was about 14, not when I was 12, and uh, eventually ended up at 6'2". Now I'm back to five, nine and a half. <laughs> Very depressing, uh, especially when you're playing a six foot four tennis player. And uh, but uh, what Chicago did, and it was a place of really more than they had, you had to think. You know, you wrote just to get facts, but you know, you read great books where they try, had ideas, not just facts. So the whole point of an education was ideas. And uh, so knowing why is more important than, you know, what. 
Uh, but you need, you know, new ideas need facts. So you really have to be, I think, a voracious reader. And I started being a reader when I was certainly at 12. My father would take me into the library every Friday night and I'd bring back a couple of books. And uh, so my brain filled up with facts. And then I learned, you know, it was really in my third year, try and figure out how your teacher thinks. Then you'll know what's on it will be on his exams. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the other is <laughs> just don't take courses where you don't get good grades. Now, you could say the opposite. You should really learn, you know, solid geometry. <laughs> but, well, you don't have to. <laughs> and uh, so I never learned solid geometry. It's never hurt me. And uh, so uh, and the easiest way to get, uh, it turned out, good grades was to take biology courses. <laughs> because physics and chemistry was, you know, for boys. Biology was girls. You know, it was just a lower level. And uh, so I always got A's. Except in botany where I got a B because we were judged on our ability to draw. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I had bright friends. And I had one or two normal ones when most of them, you know, were you know, Jewish kids who were really fun to be with. And, uh, and then, you know, gravitor teachers who know who you are. And the best way for teachers to know who you are is just to go up to class afterwards and ask questions. So I, I always should ask questions at the end of lectures. And uh, I never took notes. That was a mistake. But I concluded that you couldn't really understand a lecture if you were trying to take notes. You had to listen to it and try to see if you understood it. Uh, that got me into problems later. And uh, then I was lucky is that by the time I ended college, I knew I didn't want to be a naturalist but wanted to go after the gene. So I chose the right graduate school. And uh, the key thing was reading while uh, at the during my junior year of the book, What is Life by Schrodinger, which said the essence of life is the information present in genes and how can they be copied. And that just sort of gave me a big objective and uh, uh, said there was a Delbrook model of the gene, who I thought must be some heavy uh, German physicist, but he wasn't. But anyways, I went and heard Sewell Wright's lectures. And uh, so uh, that was just really exciting. What were genes? Whereas Mendel's laws I didn't like. It just seemed to me, you know, routine. And uh, so they didn't stimulate me. And, and so I went to Indiana because Caltech rejected me. And Caltech rejected me because there was just no chemistry or physics in my background. And so I didn't look like I would succeed there. Uh, but uh, Indiana had, besides uh, the great uh, biologist Herman Moore, it had a, a, a younger son born in Luria and uh, some really very good faculty. So uh, I was very lucky I went to Indiana. I was close by my home, so everything was easier. And there's some of my uh, uh, fellow students. Uh, I had the advantage from being at Chicago that when I arrived in graduate school, I just knew so much more than any of my fellow graduate students. I'd sort of become an adult, and they were just, you know, playing around with being adults. And uh, so, uh, let's see what. So one, you know, get a, a young thesis advisor so you're in a new field. And, uh, and don't be put off by you know, people 
being arrogant because if you're doing something new, probably people are somewhat threatened by it. That you know, and uh, so there will be some people who don't like you because you're uh, sort of rejecting the old. But I think you have to. Uh, and uh, I, I, I would go to all talks and seminars. I went to took courses in my third year. So uh, I have the, uh, I really benefited by serious intelligent courses that made me write term papers. So I find that our culturally harbor education a bit inadequate now. Uh, it only goes for too short a time and it isn't a period where you actually learn anything. <laughs> you learn how to do science, but you don't really learn facts and uh, so it's just too short. And you could say it's too short because we don't have money to pay for the teachers. There are a lot of reasons why we ended up what we did. But I think it can be even better, that's all. And so uh, I think uh, it's really nice if you have a book for advanced courses. And right now, no books are appearing for advanced courses. So, uh, unsuccessfully, I've tried to argue John Ingalls to start, you know, making textbooks, <laughs> short things for you know. Just right now, what should you know? And one of the awful things is there's so many facts coming out every day. Which ones papers do you read, and so on? So I think you need. More help than you'll get in a form of things is just becoming it's so much now we're sophisticated, and uh, it's very important. Uh, so, uh, and there aren't many places in the United States now that really teach you that level. Uh, you won't learn anything at any medical school because the faculty is just there to write research grants not actually spend time teaching. And, uh, you know, you have good teaching at Berkeley, at Stanford, at uh, MIT, Caltech, probably good teaching in maybe 15 places. Not the more anymore. So I think we're going to find a contraction in the number of good scientists in the United States. <laughs> Just because uh, by good scientists, I mean people who be really trained to uh, you know, go for the frontier. And I'm not saying that's going to be harm our country. You know, 15 really good places is pretty outstanding if you have 15 good. And I'm just hoping we can maintain 15. Uh, and uh, my first thesis advisor, Luria, brought me here to Cold Spring Harbor when I was 20. And really, you know, every day asked me what I was doing. So, you know, he and Del Becco and I were in the sort of big room which was carved up into his office and uh, some benches in a hole in the wall and then uh, some experimental space. But uh, I really couldn't have had a better training. So, uh, and then uh, there's uh, uh, Delbrook, the one who, uh, really had the most influence on me uh, and was the one who told me never do anything boring. <laughs> I gave him something potentially boring I was going to do and he just really got mad at me. said only <laughs> uh, do something and it was that summer of 1949 at, at Caltech. Uh, uh, then I decided that I would stop working on viruses and somehow just study DNA. Uh, it, it, this, uh, this seven, leave a research field before it bores you. So what I was doing, I wasn't at all unhappy working with viruses, it was just the other seemed more interesting. And sort of this was the Delbrook message to me. Uh, you know, you had to go ahead of time, and I was very lucky because the big problems hadn't been solved. Uh, 
Quantum mechanics was, the great papers were written in 25 by Dirac and Heisenberg. And Delbrook entered the field about three years later. So he was left with minor things to do, which he did. And the same was true of Robert Oppenheimer when he got the thing done three years late. So it's very important to really get in the field early. Uh, and uh, and then the last two, never be the brightest person. Uh, try and have people around you who can help you. You just move faster. So, you know, I, I like to move fast. I like to walk fast. I eat fast. You know, those sort of uh, and then last, always have someone to save you. You really are very dangerous if there isn't someone in the world who doesn't believe you're worth saving. And it can't be your parents. So it's, it's got to be your teachers. It can't be a friend. It's got to be, you know, someone who can give you a job or in some sense see that your education is continued. So you just, so that means that people who are inherently sort of unsocial, they're going to have a real hard time in life. And you would think, well, science is just ideas, but interacting with people is more important. Uh, and, uh, you know. And then uh, the obvious thing, you know, when I chose DNA in 49, <laughs> you didn't have to be bright to make that decision. I told that anyone who has an IQ of 120, that's all you need in order to be a real success in life. You don't have to be 150 when you begin to be autistic. So, but you have to be at a certain level. If your IQ 100, just don't forget. But, you know, because your brain has to get into a certain amount of facts. But, you know, DNA was <laughs> the next big step. It was in all chromosomes. And then, you know, Avery's 44. But I think I was the virtually only person who took Avery seriously. Hanshi's came along a little later. But, you know, I was, you know. And so the two real decisions were 49 focused on DNA which sent me to Copenhagen, where I was going to learn to do biochemistry on DNA. And then uh, in 51, when I saw the x-ray picture. So I went to Copenhagen, really because Niels Bohr was there, and he was the hero of the world of quantum mechanics. He was certainly the one who made the importance in Delbrook's life. And, uh, But, and that was a tiny meeting there. Uh, but when I went there, I discovered it was real luck that Cal Carr wasn't, he had taken the phage course. So I thought somebody was taking the phage course would know that. You know. But he was studying the synthesis of nucleosides. So he was an Arthur Kornberg-like person. Anyways, I left Copenhagen and saw the x-ray photograph. And, uh, so I immediately asked Wilkins, could I go work with him? Because I, I knew I had to leave Copenhagen. And he didn't say yes or no, but went back to London and told uh, uh, the people there that if I ever showed up, tell them that Wilkins was not in town. <laughs> so, uh, you know, <laughs> so it was really great luck that uh, Maria, uh, I met John Kendrew at Ann Arbor and uh, Kendrew said he would take me in Cambridge. So I went to Cambridge and uh, there was Wilkins, uh, a very decent man, uh, but not decisive. And there was Cambridge. I mean, the moment I saw Cambridge, you know, it's the most beautiful place in the world. All I want to do now is make other places like Cambridge. So if you want to understand me, Cambridge was the dominant influence in my life. Just something about it. They're both the buildings and then, <laughs> more important, the people, of whom the most important that was Francis Crick. Uh, he was 35. Uh, he had been in the war. 
Uh, everything he did there was still classified top secret, so he never talked about it. And uh, he had been essentially hired to be the theorist, the one who could really understand X-ray diffraction. Then they were trying to solve the structure of uh, three-dimensional structure of proteins. And Francis says he told them they had to, you know, solve the phase problem and isomorphous replacement. Francis was not an experimentalist. Uh, and so the thing that was dominated was a conversation about Linus Pauling because he proposed the alpha helical fold for polypeptides. And Bruce and Cambridge had shown that it was right. And then so my first morning of meeting Francis was, could you build a model of DNA? And, uh, and the boss was Sir Lawrence Bragg, and uh, he had very mixed feelings for Francis, but the chief one was get rid of Crick. And he said he made his ears buzz. And then Francis made the mistake of doing a small discussion of when Bragg proposed an idea, Francis interrupted him and said, that's the idea I talked about two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, that's my idea. Uh, Bragg was very upset and uh, essentially called Crick in and said he had to leave, but Bragg, being a decent person, very decent, realized he couldn't get rid of Crick until Crick had finished his PhD. So he had two years. And then the real problem was how to contain Francis's voice. And luckily, a spare room became available, and they put Francis in, and they put me in. So we had more space if we had a room bigger than Bragg, <laughs> just to keep Crick quiet. And so, you know, <laughs> learning structure. And then we came up with an awful structure, which is all in the double helix. So I really, we were forbidden to work on DNA. At this stage, I was taking x-ray pictures of DNA, but I went to the French Riviera, to France, and down below with Hugh Huxley. And uh, this is a picture of Rosalind Franklin, because what we learned from Wilkins is that they, at King's, where he'd taken the photograph, he had suddenly lost control of his field, and the x-ray work had been passed to uh, this uh, physical chemist trained woman, Rosalind Franklin, who was not an X-ray crystallographer, but understood, and she was thought she's more qualified than Wilkins, who was really an old-fashioned physicist. And uh, you notice Rosalind had pearls. She came from a very, very important family, the Samuels. So they considered themselves, you know. They were only officially upper middle class, but in fact, they were. <laughs> Lord Samuels was her uncle. And uh, so it was impossible to know whether Rosalind was shy or a snob. I think she was both. And uh, she certainly was, uh, she was going to St. Paul's Girl School. She was difficult. And in the play in London, uh, 51, where Nicole Kidman plays her, <laughs> It's correct that they have made Rosalind difficult to get along with. So, uh, and this was the height of her uh, lunacy uh, of having taken a photograph, or uh, Gosling took it, of the bee form and having the wonderful bee form and still two months later holding a party to celebrate the death of the helix. So, you know, you often say people are really more governed by passion than reason. And reason is only used to justify passion, <laughs> or largely. That's you have your passion and then you're trying to argue why you should have it. So she was trying to, to she didn't want a helix because Wilkins had said helix. I had said helix Francis. She didn't want it. She didn't have anything instead, she had nothing. And uh, so that was uh, the state of affairs. That all we kept saying is Linus Pauling will get interested in it. And uh, so this was passing the time at a meeting in a chateau in France. About two thirds of everyone intelligent in biology said that picture. 
and then I went into the Alps, and there was Francis and I, and this, we were still forbidden from working on DNA, so I was working with Bill Hayes on bacterial genetics. And then suddenly, we hear there's Pauling's manuscript. Pauling has made a model, a helical model of DNA, and so uh, through the, his son, uh, we get it, and I read it, and I realize it's wrong. You know, I just could not believe it, that Pauling would propose something that even me, as you know, a beginning chemist would see as crap. And uh, so we were very, very happy. And uh, so I took the picture into London to, to show Wilkins, or first I saw Roslyn, and she said, I don't want to read the paper, I don't have to read it because the DNA is not a helix. So complete nonsense. And uh, so then I find Wilkins. <laughs> I say, she told me it's not a helix. And he goes to a drawer and pulls out. There, there it is. Photograph 51. <laughs> which immediately says, <laughs> it's a helix, which two chain helix repeating in 34 angstroms. And uh, so, uh, and Francis saw data which really uh, the space group. And so he knew there was, it was a two chain helix running in opposite direction. And then the question what held them together in the middle, it had to be the base ferret. So I was fooling around with like with like because I was stuck. And then this Caltech trained chemist, Jerry Donnie, who was had sort of postdoc with Pauling, spent a year in Cambridge, looked at what I was doing and said, you got the hydrogen atoms in the wrong place. Yeah, I have uh, uh, enol, and whereas quantum mechanics says guanine and thymine are going to be keto. That was the thing. So that was all, you know, it occurred in five minutes. And uh, so the next morning, I tried to put them together. They were, you know, was, I did this before Francis came in. Francis always spent Saturday morning reading Nature. And then when he read Nature or what he wanted to read, then he'd come in. And then he saw that and we knew that was, uh, the problem was over because the symmetry of the base pairs said they run in opposite directions. So you had a confirmation. So. So then we went to lunch and said we found the structure of life. I was drawn by Odile. Her goofy picture. The paper was submitted about a month after we found it, the thing. And after the people from King's had come up and written two independent papers, Rosalind finally changed her mind. The week we after we found the structure, she actually began to analyze the B form and realized it was a two chain helix. So she could write up her things. There I came to Cold Spring Harbor and uh, that's the Nobel Prize. Uh, missing is the great, is the Nobel Prize winner for physics, Lev Landau, the great Russian, who had been in a terrible car crash, who was a very good friend to Gallo. And then this is just uh, uh, my book, The Double Helix, which uh, came out of having to give lectures to beginning students at Harvard. So I was very lucky, I, you know, was that I had to be a teacher because it made me write the book. So uh, that's, that's the story. So it's, uh, I think probably the best story of the history of science, <laughs> and, and I mean the best story for grammar school students. That is, <laughs> you don't have to, you know, the DNA Learning Center can teach the double helix. Other things get more difficult. So it was simple and uh, it had interesting people. Uh, from my viewpoint, a very happy ending. And uh, the, uh, of course, we had no idea what was going to follow. And uh, uh, it took about 
five years for, you know, the, there was one year when there was no quotation in nature at all. <laughs> Paper wasn't quoted it was. But a few people like Seymour Benzer knew, the, you know, the implication. So it uh, uh, was good. I spoke a little too long, but it takes this time to go through it. But so, uh, uh, So it was a combination of very good education. And so I've always been an educator wanting to, you know, if, if this is the sort of thing, you, the discovery you want to make, what you have to learn and so on. Anyways, uh, uh, and someone reading the book said, you were, you were very calculating all the time. You know, you didn't make any bad choice. But, uh, I didn't have many choices to make. That was the lucky thing. <laughs> you know, that I, I wasn't rushed or hurried. Uh, and starting with, you know, having good parents and real belief in the truth, and then uh, strong support from Gloria and Delbrook, and then meeting uh, these other people who could, you know, get excited by the double hills. Uh, it's. Uh, I think uh, uh, genetics is uh, is always going to be controversial because it says something about human beings, and sometimes what it says you don't want. And uh, so uh, I'm in deep shit because of uh, you know. Uh, uh, believing in, uh, in genetics. And uh, so, uh, but I'd rather be in deep shit than not be a geneticist. <laughs> so, you know, if you have, have the alternative. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, some of you out there, in, in your future are gonna have times when you gotta stand up for, free speech and truth and uh, support unpleasant people who, unpleasant, you know, who got into trouble. You know, they can't get into trouble a hundred times, but if someone's only in trouble once a year, that's not bad. <laughs> and do it. Anyways, uh, uh, the, uh, You know, by the time Double Helix came out, I, I had enough money so when I accepted uh, uh, the job here, I could ha I had enough money to build Osterhout so we could live someplace. So uh, an another rule, <laughs> another rule is uh, have more money than you need, <laughs> and you have <laughs> your freedom. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.